First of all, I'd like to acknowledge my sincere thanks to Aidawa team, Brother Yusuf and his, his uh, whole uh, crew to uh, accompany and invite me over here. Uh, and may Allah increase all of our knowledge. Uh, may Allah give us the hikmah. May Allah make us obedient Muslims as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to. Amen. At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I want you to all listen to this carefully. At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there used to be a sahaba. His name was Sa'ad. Sa'ad al-Aswad al-Sulumi radiallahu anhu. Al-Aswad means black. So he was dark in color. Okay? Listen to this carefully. Okay? And especially the brothers, you know, the sisters were from subcontinent, were a bit more dark as well. So we get a little bit inferiority complex. Sa'ad al-Aswad radiallahu anhu, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Will I enter Jannah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sa'ad, you will enter Jannah if your deeds are deserving to reach Jannah. Then Sa'ad said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and make it a habit whenever I say Rasulullah, as many times as I say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Because this is obligatory on all of us Muslims to do so. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Sa'ad, if your um, deeds are worthy of Jannah, you will enter Jannah. But he said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people take me as inferior. I'm considered as inferior amongst other people. So he felt inferiority complex, okay? He felt that he had genuine limitations. His color, he was poor. So he said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why would not anyone let me marry their daughters? So uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, go to Fula Fula, I've just uh, forgot his name right now, okay? And he is amongst the Ansar, he has recently converted to, uh, reverted to Islam, and ask him for his daughter. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, he gets elated, he gets happy, and he goes to that house and knocks on the door. The father comes out and he says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told me to come and propose for your daughter. And when the father says, he's a re newly reverted Muslim, okay? He says, you, off you go, okay? Because he, thinks, he sees Sa'ad radiallahu anhu as inferior. And the daughter is listening. You know, the father is answering to Sadr The daughter is listening. And the daughter says, Wait, Yabu, wait, wait. This is the Prophet's proposal. If we refuse this proposal, where will we be? Where will we be if we refuse the Rasulullah's proposal? And she said to Sadr, Go and tell Rasulullah, I will marry you. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, he gets happy, he gets very elated and he rushes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that this woman is now ready to marry me. And by the way, the reason why his father was refusing is because she was the, he was a leader of Medina, number one. And number two, his daughter was so beautiful. So there was a bit of mix and a match, we're talking about chalk and cheese over here. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said, I will marry, I'll, I'll do your nikah for 400 dirham. And then Sa'ad radiallahu anh, he answered, 400 dirham? I've never seen 400 dirham in my life. So he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Sa'ad, you go to Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anh, you go to Uthman radiallahu anh, you go to Ali radiallahu anh, and you collect 200 dirhams from each. And he goes to them, and he gets 200 dirhams each plus. And now he has got this money that he's never ever seen. He's so happy. And he goes to the marketplace and he's thinking, you know, and you know, subhanAllah, you're getting to married, you're getting married to a beautiful woman, okay? A lady. And the thoughts of marriage coming. I'm going to be married now. Imagine this. Live this, my dear brothers, okay? He's going to the marketplace and he's thinking, I'll get this jewelry, I'll get that jewelry. And all of a sudden, listen to this, what he hears. He hears the call of jihad. 
He hears the call of jihad. And he is thinking and looking up at the sky now. Ya Allah, I have to please you as well. It's a bit of a dilemma now. You're considering yourself as inferior. And now Allah is testing you. What will you do, Sa'ad? What will you do? And Sa'ad radiallahu anh, leaves the jewelry besides and he goes and buys a horse and a sword. Subhanallah. And he goes to the battlefield, he covers his face up. When he covers his face up, the Sahaba, they have a little bit of reservation. Who is this man who has just come over here and he's willing to fight? Ali radiallahu anh says, let it be. He has come here for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and let him fight. And he is fighting furiously, Sa'ad radiallahu anh, with the intention to be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A moment ago, he left his marriage proposal. If he becomes a shaheed, he goes straight to Jannatul Firdaus, okay? So, my dear brothers, the story, the narration carries on that now he's involved in the battlefield and a few minutes later, Sa'ad radiallahu anh's horse, it has been slashed off, his leg has been slashed off with a sword. He falls down, he gets a bit stripped, okay, from his, from his leg. And, so, and obviously, his, his, uh, I believe, subhanAllah, let's not mention the narration of common sense would prevail over here, that his face is a nast. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Sa'ad, is that you? And he, uh, Sa'ad radiallahu alayhi wa said, yes, ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He said, why are you here? And he says, Ya Rasulullah, this is for you and for uh, this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for you. For your sake, I have come to join the battlefield. And then after a few minutes, we hear the Sahaba radiallahu anhum announce that Sa'ad radiallahu anhu has been martyred. And Rasulullah rushes towards Sa'ad radiallahu anhu. He picks up his head and puts it on his thigh. And he's crying. The tears are coming and flowing onto the head, onto the face of Sa'ad radiallahu anhu. He's crying, and then he smiles, and then he turns his face away. Abu Lubaba radiallahu anhu is looking to him carefully, and says, asks Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi very innocently, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is this? We've never seen you like this before. You are upset, then you smiled, and then you turned your face away. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this man, this man was longing for Jannah. He came to me and he asked, will I enter Jannah? Okay. I cried because he fought for the cause of Allah and he, he loved me so much that he came into the battle even though he was supposed to get married. Number one. I smiled because I saw the Hulul Ayn rushing towards him. His wives in Jannah to court, rushing towards him and giving him the glad tidings. And while they were running, their shins were uncovered, so I turned my face away. Subhanallah. This was a Sahaba, and there's so many names over here. Time does not permit me, but what do we understand, my dear brothers and sisters? The least minimum that we can do is sort out our differences. What is important and what is not important? Not to waste time. Not to think that this is only this life that we're going to be living in. My dear respected elders and my respected sisters over here, your duty is to nourish your children and look at them the best way, especially my sisters over here. If you and your husbands cannot get well along, it's going to be a toxic environment. Know that we are Muslims and we are a minority in Australia and we have to work hard. We have to send our children to all of these halakats and all to these shiuch. Okay, be careful where you're taking your Islam from. Wallahi, you and I are going to be all accountable. Sa'ad radiallahu anh was a brave warrior. He made the right decision at the right time. A minute, a, a few minutes, a moment in my narration, he was asking Rasulullah sallam, thinking of himself that he's inferior. No one is inferior. Not you, not you, not anyone else. Allah looks at the taqwa. Allah does not look at your nationality. Allah does not see you're an American, you're an Australian, you're from wherever. Allah will, getting your nationality, working so hard for it, does, will not assure you any guarantee in Jannah. Just know this, my dear brothers. This world is honestly rubbish. It is really rubbish. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa once he was visiting the marketplace. And his sahaba, 
radiallahu anhu, they were so fond of him. They were so much, you know, enthusiastic to learn from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw a dead carcass, a dead sheep, and it had very small ears, okay? And it's rotten and flies are actually swarming through it, okay? So he picks up the dead carcass and he says to his sahaba, who amongst you will buy it for one dirham? And the sahaba, are, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you know, this is filthy, you know, subhanAllah. Who will buy it off for one dirham? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Okay, don't buy it for one dirham. Don't buy it for one dirham. Get it for free, ya khay. Ya khwan, get it for free. And the sahaba said, Yes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it's dead. And for argument's sake, if it was alive, it has a defect, it has small ears. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that similarly, the world in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes is so less of paramount importance. Okay? It is very haqir. So my dear brothers, our importances in life, they have to be prioritized. Are we just going to be running, you know, 24-7 after the dunya? Or is it going to be after as well? Talking about myself, but alhamdulillah. As the brother was introducing, may Allah give him rewards, okay? And give him a higher status in the dunya and akhirah, I mean, and all of us as a matter of fact, I mean. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always about myself. Ya Allah, save me from riyah. Save me from riyah because I do a lot of public talking. I do a lot of public preaching, okay? And I'm sure many of you do as well. The point I'm trying to make over here is that I did my degrees in, in medicine as well. Then I realized, and especially the youth over here, I realized that I don't even know about my Islam. These questions that you were asking, many people didn't even know about it. And it's the basics. Wouldn't you like, we claim, see, Akhwan, my dear sisters, listen to this. We claim that we love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Words, words are simple, okay? Words can be dodgy, words can be deceiving, words can be deceptive. If you really love uh, Rasulullah know him like how you know your father. Know him like how you like love your mother. This is how you will attain the success in this world and the hereafter because you will li listen and you will learn and you will ponder and you will implement all the lessons that have been explained to you. How Rasulullah lived his life. He did not live his life for himself. He taught so many morals, so many pearls of wisdom that are far beyond the imagination of the scope of this lecture. Moving on, my dear brothers and sisters, I see Alhamdulillah, there are youth over here, especially towards youth, okay? Do not, please do not think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has implemented and has ordained you, has made it for, for you, obligatory for you to pray five times a day. That is a must. If you are into drugs, may Allah protect all of us, still pray. If you are into smoking, pray. If your clothes, the most reason, you know how you bring youngsters to the masjid, okay? Ah, oh, you know, Sheikh, my clothes are not clean. Okay, I need to take a shower. I went to the loo, okay, and still, you know, I think there was a few drops of urine, okay, that came on my clothes. I can't pray. Well, that's not the deal. That's not what Surah Salaam said. You clean it off with some water. Okay, you don't have to go to home and change, you know, your clothes and do it all over. Pray. You do not have the excuse to not to pray. The prayer is the distinction between us and them. Who's them? The non-Muslims. I wish we all can start implementing this fact that how we tell stories of Elsa, of Barbies and whatnot, okay? We tell them stories, bedtime stories of the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat, okay? That's the way how they will learn Islam. That's the way how will they will live Islam. So my dear brothers, it's not that the only month of Ramadan is the one schooling, uh, that institute of education, that training, the spiritual learning that we are supposed to get really indwelled in and then out of when Ramadan is gone, the masajid are getting empty and everything, over and, over and done. That's not how it is. We cannot expect how long we're going to be living, but we live actually as a matter of fact that we know how much long we're going to be living. Oh, I'm a youngster. I'm a youngster. When I'm going to go, oh, I'll get older, I've done my studies, I've done, you know, looked, uh, get, got married, I've got children, then I will go to Hajj. Yeah, do you really know that? That you're going to make it till then? 
Okay. So we have plans five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. A big problem these days, you see, alhamdulillah, I've had the privilege to work in many different organizations within, within Melbourne. The biggest problem is that we have an Islamic organization and may Allah protect this organization from this fitna. We're fighting amongst ourselves. We make up a shura and the sisters might say, ah, oh, pizza is not nice. We're not going to present that to the you know guys, okay? And there's a fitna amongst the sisters, okay? The, I mean, you're doing this work for who? To please people and give them pizza? People are not going to starve. We're living in Australia. The system of Omar radiallahu anh, Central Link Child Care Benefits is working here in Australia. You're not going to die here hungry. But we have so much fitna. A brother who is shy, who is studying hard, who is giving religious talks. Just because he has a certain nationality, or because if you're going to give him that opportunity to talk into uh, organizations, you are going to be felt that you're actually backstab, uh, doing a back step, okay? Not backstabbing, back, back step. So you step backwards, okay? And there's so much of religious problems. Uh, Mashiach comes from overseas. When we've seen this many times, oh, we're gonna get this brother over here. If he prays over there, we're not going to have any more connections with you. SubhanAllah. In 2% minority in Australia, we're having these issues? Shame on us. So, unless and until we get united, my dear brothers and sisters, we are swaying away and away. Once, listen to this, my dear brothers and sisters. Once a boy was dragged into a courtyard. The courtyard of who? Omar radiallahu anhu. And this courtyard, Omar radiallahu anhu, you know, people want to learn from him. People want to see the insaf. People want to see how much of haq he talks about. And people are so scared of him. So the courtyard is jam-packed. And Omar radiallahu anhu sees that this boy is being dragged into the courtyard. And he says, why is this boy being dragged here into the courtyard? And two brothers are actually pulling him. So when he stands up, he... The, the brothers over here who are dragging him, they say that this boy has killed our father. Umar radiallahu anh says to the boy, have you killed his father, their father? And he says, yes, I have killed the father, but it was accidentally done. Because my camel used to tread on their land. And so the father of these two brothers, he got angry, he picked up a stone and he hit the camel. And I saw my camel was in pain. The camel was bleeding. So I picked up a stone in retaliation and I hit the, the, the father. And it hit his head and he died. And that's what the story is, Umar radiallahu anh. So Umar radiallahu anh said to the brothers, will you forgive this young boy? So the brothers were very angry. They were adamant. And they said, no, this is going to be pisas. This is going to be Retribution, eye for eye, tit for tat, okay? If he killed, he's going to die as well now. There's not going to be any haq on this now. So Umar anh said to the boy, have you listened to their statement? What, do you have any last wishes? Do you have any last words? So the boy said, Ya Umirul Mu'mineen, my father passed away recently, and I have a young brother, and I have hidden some money where only I know. If you could grant me three days, I can go to my town and arrange that money so that when I die, my brother does not suffer in my absence. And Omar radiallahu is like, yeah, right. I'm going to listen to this story now. So Omar radiallahu anh, and he, he swears, please listen to me. You know, I'm going to die. I have to do some arrangements for my brother. And Omar radiallahu anh says, okay, fine. I'll listen to your story. I'll let you go on the condition that you find a guarantor in this crowd. And the boy stands, he looks up, he looks up high and he says, is there anyone who is going to help me today? Who is going to be my guarantor? And he looks around and no one is there to help him out. Then they say, they see in this packed courtyard, a hand is being raised. And that hand is being raised of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari radiallahu anhu. And Omar radiallahu anh said, are you sure you want to be a guarantor of this boy? And he says, yeah, Omar radiallahu anh, I will be his guarantor. And the boy, he leaves. Now let me tell you what a guarantor means. You know, there's a fair deal being made here, that he has to go back and he has to arrange something for his, uh, for his family. 
So a guarantor is one who is going to take responsibility if he does not come back that boy in three days, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari of the Allah, the great companion who has done a lot of preaching, okay, through um, the blessed lips of Prophet Sallallahu orders, he is going, his head is going to be cut off. So he's going to be beheaded. So it's a very hard deal now here. So the boy one day passes by. Okay, time is running out. The second day passes by and the third day comes. There is no signal, no sign, no, pro uh, you know, uh, all, everyone is anticipating where this child is. And if Abu Dhar al-Fadi is going to give the life, how big of a shame it's going to be. So now the time is clicking and the two brothers who want the retribution, they go to, Umar, uh, to Abu Dhar al-Fadi and say that now let's go to the courtyard. And he is being reminded that now Qisas is going to be done. So Abu Dhar the father of the Allah says, Maghrib, at that time, the day ends at Maghrib. So there's still a few minutes, but he goes into the courtyard in Medina. Everyone, he's the talk of the town. My dear brothers and sisters, listen to this. He is the talk of the town, Abu Dhar the father of the Allah. Everyone is like, we wish the boy comes. And the boy actually comes just a few minutes before Maghrib Adhan. And everyone is rejoicing. Allahu Akbar. And they're like, will the, the brothers forgive? What will happen here? And Omar asks the boy, why did you come back? I did not send any spies to see where you have gone. Why did you come back? Listen to this carefully. And I, this is where I'm trying to get down to. The boy said, I do not want anyone to say that Abu al has become the guarantor and I was treacherous and I did not come back. I did not want anyone to say that this boy has misled this man and he has lost his life because of this boy. And then Abu Dhar al-Fari is being summoned, he's being questioned by Umar al Why did you become his guarantor? So Abu Dhar al-Fari he says that I did not want anyone to say that this man was being, this boy was being helpless and there was no one to help him. SubhanAllah. How tough, how difficult it is in these countries to become someone's guarantor. You don't even know them, okay? But people come and they say, we will do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Abu Dhar al did. Had he not come by Maghrib, he would have been beheaded. And this is what the Sharia says. So my dear brothers, don't be just selfish for yourselves. Don't be having so much of envy for each other. If you do not know the other person, love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves those people who help others. And he keeps helping those people who are helping others. This is what is mentioned in the hadith. Okay? So my dear brothers, we really have to think about not living our own lives, but thinking about other people as well. When we talk about sincere repentance, Think how many, how many times we sin in a day. Think about it. No, no, none of us are perfect. We are Bani Adam, aren't we? When our father and mother have sinned, so we're tantamount that we're going to be sinning as well. But the difference between Adam السلام, and Iblis was that Adam السلام, accepted that he was wrong. And he made sincere repentance. Where Shaitan, he got adamant, he got proud, and he said, no Allah, I will sit in the path of your believers and I will astray them. I will lead them to, Jah to Jahannam, right, left, you know, from the front and the back. So, Shaitan took a vow to mis mislead us so that we can go into Jahannam. Billah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said that I will help those people, I will help those believers who will be steadfast on the deen. So don't take, the, take this deen as a joke. Don't take it as lightly, my dear youngsters, my brothers and my sisters. You know, when it comes to forgiving people, this is something very important. How many brothers, how many sisters we have? We're talking about our own family. You must have your brothers back home. And we do not have any more ties with them. Because the father passed away, there was an Islamic will, and it was, you know, it was a bit factitious now. It was altered. And the brothers and sisters are not talking anymore. These are the, by the way, these are the same brothers and sisters who you raised, were raised up with. You had beautiful times with these brothers and sisters, okay? Your neighbors, for example, your friends, 
We hold grudges. Wallahi, we hold grudges like mountains in our hearts. And that's why we are so discontent. We're not content with our lives anymore. In this dunya, what do Rasulullah say? If you are going to be looking at this youngster's Mercedes and he's going to be getting jealous, you know what? I've got a BMW, but it's 50 years older, okay? But at least it's, 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 it's a BMW, you know? And he's got a brand new flash Mercedes. So he's always going to make it a point he's going to be jealous. No matter how high he goes, he's going to be like, oh, he's got a Ferrari. And he's got at least $1 million in his account, you know, sitting over there. In this dunya, always look at people who are lower than you, so you can be content. And in the akhirah, I talk to my youngsters over here, that always in the deen, make sure you look at people who know more than you. So if you have friends, and they have very limited Islamic knowledge, it's time to, you know, I wouldn't say it, but you know, get gather into the, into into the gatherings where you are being taught the proper Islamic knowledge. Wallahi, when you're otherwise, when you're going to get more older, Shaitan's not going to leave you. Shaitan is not going to leave you till your deathbed. He has vowed that he's going to take you to Jahannam. Okay, so you have to make sure that the friends that you are sitting with, with sit, standing up, with walking around with, okay, the company that you carry, that makes a big a big implementation on yourself. You know how we get into problems? And we're like, Ya Allah, sisters would be saying, Ya Allah, why me? You know, why me? What happened here? Brothers, you know, they got this new job after sitting idle for five, six months. And they're nearly arrived in Australia or whatsoever the reason. And now after five or six months, they get this new job. And then after a couple of months, guess what? Either they're laid off or, you know, there's an accident that happens and they lose, start losing money, okay? And they're like, instead of doing shukr, they're like, Ya Allah, you know, I wish, you know, you could be more kinder to me, astaghfirullah. You know, we're always in the habit of just being discontent. No shukr whatsoever. And Allah tests and trials us for reasons. And they're not mere punishments, my dear brothers and sisters. If Allah is causing some problems in your family, if you're being sick, if you're being ill, if you're losing money, there must be khair in it. Who was more, the Rasulullah said in an authentic hadith, that the Nabi, the Anbiya to Salam are tested the most in this world. And after that, the Sahaba then the Tabi'een and the Tabi'een. So, in gather in the, in the best generations. So if you are being tested, if you are being tested, Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to purify you. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, how much of difficulties, how much of pain that they used to go to. Umar radiallahu anhu once saw the back of Khabab ibn Arat radiallahu anhu and he saw caves in his back. Caves. There was skin that was defective. There was not skin in there. It was like punched out holes. So if you punch out these, you know, lame walls, you will see your hand finger okay, over there. There's nothing over there. That's how his back was. And he used to say that Rasulullah I'm just telling you another hadith as well. When uh, Rasulullah was just lying beside the Kaaba with his cloak as his pillow, he went to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, so much of trials, so much of fitan there are. If you make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will listen to you. Why don't you make dua so that our trials and tribulations are lessened? And Rasulullah got furious. Listen to this what he said. He said, there were nations before you, and a pit was being dug. And they were put into that pit, and an iron saw, I'm not joking here, iron saw with sharp um, combs, they would slice the person into halves, and they would not renounce their faith for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What has happened to you, Khabab? So Umar radiallahu anhu, when he checked out his back, he started crying. What are we doing for this ummah? We are selfish. We are in our homes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered an angel to destroy one whole town. And when the angel went there and he said, and he looked at one of the people over there, he used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like 24-7. Okay, this was the, the, the uh, this nature of this, this abid. He was a, one of the strongest abid. And the angel went back to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, you want me to destroy this guy? He doesn't even you know, disobey you for the blink of an eye. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, start the punishment from this person. So what is the moral? That do not sit at your home. Don't step back, okay? You have to progress forward. You have to preach the deen of Allah. Rasulullah said, convey from me even a verse, a single verse. So we can do that. All we need to do is just refine ourselves, polish ourselves, and make it towards the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will grant us barakah. I was talking about forgiving other people, and then I got a little bit into a tangent. You know how difficult it is to forgive people? You know that, right? We all hold grudges, and I was using that metaphor that we are have mountains of hatred amongst ourselves. Wallahi, my dear brothers and sisters, make it a point. Try, you know what? Allah does not like, to, Allah does not hate deception. I use my words carefully. Allah does not hate deception. Which deception? If you fake tears and cry near Allah, one day those tears are not going to be artificial. They're not going to be crocodile tears. They're going to be real tears. If you're going to be, I was telling you, if you fornicate, if you have intimacy with your girlfriend, if you are doing the wrong things, if you are looking at porn, still pray. Still pray. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Salat al al fahshai wal munkar. Okay? So, Salat. It keeps you away from all these dirty things. If you do not stop, if you stop praying, how will you correct yourself? Allah will put that rahmah so that you stay away from all of these things. And please forgive me. These are the realities of life. I'm talking about what the problem is in the youth. And that's why I'm saying these things very bluntly. Because no youth will come to his father and tell him that this is what I'm doing behind the doors. He has to know it through me. He has to know it from other people. Don't think your son is so innocent that a kiss on the uh, cheeks is going to suffice. Maybe, may Allah protect all of our children. We're living in the Western countries. You do not know what's happening with these gadgets these days. And all the tricks that these children have, it is just insane. Okay, May Allah guide our children. And wallahi, no matter how much you nurture your children, Leave it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will polish people. He will polish these children. But these children have, a, they have an act of obedience towards you as well. My dear brothers, my dear youngsters over here. Did you know that there was a man from Tabi'een, which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he is amongst the best of Tabi'een. Did you know who that was? This man, he was born in Yemen. He was from Murad. He was from the tribe of Al Qaran. And his name was Uwais Al Qarani. Did you know he was at the time of Rasulullah? What is the definition of a Sahaba? The definition of a Sahaba is that you meet and greet Prophet whilst you're a Muslim. But he didn't get time. Now, isn't that imag is it beyond imagination? We always listen that, you know, we know for a fact. Even though if we don't know the seerah in, in detail, that Rasulullah's name is connected with Allah, isn't it? La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. You know? So what I'm trying to say is, we know that after Allah, the status of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes next. Umar radiallahu anh, he used to make sure that every year when Hajj comes, he would anticipate that Oasis is going to come. And you know why he would do that? Because Rasulullah said that when Awais comes, ya, ya Umar, ask him to make dua for you that Allah forgives your sins. He is the best of the tabi'in, the best. You know how we always want the best? This man was the best. And his credentials, what were the credentials? He used to respect his mother, love his mother who was blind. And he did not get the chance to meet Rasulullah he made sure that his mother is not left there in the loneliness. And Umar of the Allah ones, then, you know, every year he used to anticipate that Awais is going to come. And then finally one year comes when Awais al-Qarni of the Allah ones, Awais al-Qarni rahimahullah an, he comes and, you know, Umar of the Allah ones is elated. He's happy. And he questions, cross questions. Are you from Murad? He says, yes. Is your name uh, Awais? Uh, he says, yes. He says, are you from Qaran? He says, yes. He says, Umar then asks, 
Were you affected by leprosy? Leprosy is a terrible condition, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala healed Ubay Sultani when he was a kid, but only one coin of a dirham was left. The size of a dirham was left, and his leprosy was not healed. So he said, well, did you have leprosy when you were a kid? And he said, yes. And now I only have it as a sign of a coin of a dirham. That leprosy, that amount is left. So he said, yeah, always. Rasulullah gave me the glad tidings. He asked you to make dua for me. Who is Umar radiallahu Isn't he amongst the ten companions who has been raised to the status that he has been told within the time of Rasulullah that he will be granted Jannah? So subhanAllah, think about this. Well, this should be bringing tears in your eyes. That what beautiful things we know and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises your status when you are obedient, when you're dutiful to your parents. You know, how we are so miser when we are, have to give things to people? How we are miser when it comes to charity? There was a man who was actually walking on the outskirts. And this is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Authentic hadiths, okay, that I'm sharing with you, inshallah, bidnullah. There was a cloud that came. And that cloud was being instructed by a voice. And it was told to that cloud, go to Fula Fula and start raining. And this man, imagine you are in the wilderness and you see this sight. You would be like petrified. You'd be intimidated. You'd be shocked and surprised. And this man did the same thing. He started walking and seeing where the cloud is going. And then he sees that this cloud is showering rahma. Water is coming out and a man is taking his plow and he's trying to plow his field. Okay. So he goes to this man and asks a very innocent question. My dear brother, what do you do that I've seen with my eyes a cloud is in your... What is your name, by the way? He asks, what is your name? And he tells the name. He says, this is the name that I heard the cloud being instructed that it should go and should start raining on your, onto your field. What is that deed that you are doing that Allah is so happy? And I was surprised tantamountly to hear all of this. And this man says that, my dear brother, now that you have asked, I spend my money and divide it into one third on my family. Listen to this, my dear brothers and sisters. One third I spend on my family. One third I spend on my business. And one third I give it to the charity. Do this to yourself and see how much barakah, how much rahmah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you. You know, when it comes to zakat, 2.5%. And we are so scared, we are so stingy, that we can't even give this 2.5%. Allah promises you He will increase your wealth if you purify it. Otherwise, the snake, that snake which Allah has described on Yawm al akhirah will come and will start to succumb and it will squeeze your neck and it will suffocate you. And that will be your money that you started keeping hoarding that money. Allah says, al haqam wa takathur and these people, they will start gathering all of these love, all of these materialistic things. They will gather it, gather it, gather it. When the time of Salah comes, oh, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. You know, why go to the Jama'ah? It's going to waste 20 minutes. Subhanallah, my dear brothers and my sisters. Yes, the sisters are not subjected to go to the masjid, but they're not even stopped either, are they? So work on your family, my dear brothers. Advice to the sisters. Last year I was here and I spoke about the one of the best women woman that lived on the planet Earth. And uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was sitting with Jibreel alayhi salam and Jibreel alayhi salam said, "Wait, Khadija bint Khuwailid radiyallahu anha is coming to you with a cup of soup." Tell her Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending salam to her. Listen, live the moment, my dear brothers. Live the moment, my sisters. That Allah is sending salam. What kind of woman would this be? What kind of amazing woman this would be that she has such huge high credentials? You know how we sugarcoat our CVs with half of the things that we haven't even done? And Allah is witnessing and sending salam to Khadija bin Allah and her. And then Jibreel says, send my salam as well. Because she can't see Jibreel alayhi salam. And then tell her, the third part of the hadith is, that she will be granted in Jannah a palace. 
of police, which will be made up of pearls and rubies, and it will be si there will be silence in it. My sisters, are you a reason? I'm sure my sisters, please, uh, this is this is subhanAllah, now I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, going in the flow, don't take me here. I'm just, uh, for, for uh, subhanAllah, like, you know, kind of actually uh, putting you on, uh, on the spot. I'm saying, are you the source of giving happiness to your husband? Or are you the source of headache to your husband? You know, and vice versa. Brothers are smiling here, but I ask you as well. Are you the source of headaches? Or are you the source of rahmah to your family? You know? There is a lot of problems. There's a lot of frictions when two human beings, they live with each other. There's a lot of problems. A lot of animosities. Saas, bahu, chakkar, you know, and all of that going on. Subhanallah, 100 series and above and so on and forth. But listen, your husband... Wallahi, my sisters, listen to this. Listen to this, my sisters. I really request you that for you, Allah has made Jannah way more easier than us, brothers. And I'll tell you, I'll defend this with a hadith. I'll defend that with a hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that if a woman prays five times daily, prays five times daily, guards her modesty, chastity, okay, does not let the secrets of her husband out. You know, this is how we do intimacy. This is how we do dirty jokes and what to please all the other sisters. So she guards her modesty, doesn't let anyone else come, that wears her niqab and, you know, does her hijab and so on and so forth. And she fasts the month of Ramadan. She, go, she fasts the month of Ramadan and she is obedient to her husband. Fourth category. She will enter Jannah. That's not too much to ask. Okay. And I respect the sisters, subhanAllah. We cannot be anywhere close to them. You know, giving a delivery to a child, subhanAllah, being a doctor, I know. I see sisters in pain. Okay. We cannot compete them in any way. So my hats off to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make them from a crooked rib. Please, I request you, don't listen to stories of other people. Unless and until you have verified with both the husband and wife and listen to both of their quarrels. Don't say, oh, you know what, subhanAllah, five times prayer, imam, and this, this, that, that, that. And he is with this, like with his wife. Astaghfirullah. I'm never going to go and see his face. What a munafiq. Who are you? Did you know about this munafiq? That one of the Sahaba of the Allah, I'm just going to confuse his name easily, so I, I, I'll rather be quiet. It might be Zaid, Zaid of the Allah, okay, but one of the Sahaba about this thing that I'm talking to you, not going into any tangent, he was in a battlefield and he was going to slaughter someone with his sword. And at that last minute, that kuffar, he said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He knew a gateway. And the Sahaba said, you are lying, you are lying. You just want to say, be saved from my sword. And then he slaughtered him. And he was very beloved to Prophet Sallallahu the Sahaba. I, I don't want to mention his name because I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so... Sayyidina Ali. No, it wasn't him. With all respect, it wasn't him. Uh, that was something else. What does that look like? So this, uh, this Sahaba, عنه, he was so beloved. But what, did, what was the reaction of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He got so angry. He said, you, did you have those eyes to look into that person's heart? Could you look into his heart and tell that this person was not, he was lying or he was telling? So my sisters, my brothers, please don't judge people. Don't judge the book by the cover. You have to know, any times we're having these separations, divorces, even the Qadi has to listen to both sides. So if you come to me and tell me a story that this sister is terrible, she's horrible, or vice versa, this man is the worst creature on planet Earth that Allah has made, okay? Please, can you give him hidayah? How am I supposed to trust your words, sister? I don't even know you. I have to listen to both sides and then make a decision and then try to uh, create reconciliation. Forgive for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to lose my voice quickly. So is this working right now? Yes, sir. Yeah? Okay. So I was telling you, and I got carried into a tangent, that forgive people. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting and his companions was sitting was, was, were sitting with him. Listen to this, my youth. So the Sahaba were sitting with him, and when they used to sit and listen to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they used to have a lot of respect. They were very humble. They weren't questioning right and left because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would teach them adab, ethics. 
And that's what we're supposed to learn. Okay? So Rasulullah said, the man who is going to be entering in the masjid now is going to enter Jannah. Imagine, if a person's coming into this room and you get to hear this, you would be surprised, wouldn't you? You're going to ask abruptly, Ya Rasulullah why? Why is he granted Jannah? Why not us? Second day comes and Rasulullah said, the man who's going to enter, uh, come into the masjid, he's going to enter Jannah. And the third day, again, this happens. Now, the Sahaba are very quiet, they're very humble, they're very obedient. But one of the Sahaba, he's like, over with this now, okay? What, what are the credentials of this bloke, okay? That, and the credential, and, and the Sahaba that was the most curious amongst them was uh, Amr ibn As, radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Amr, Abdullah, the son, not Amr ibn As, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, radiallahu anhu, okay? So, he, he made up a story, okay? And you have to know why. First, let me give you a bit of background. I've got a few minutes, I know. Abdullah ibn Amr, okay? His credentials are, listen to this carefully, a one of the mightiest Abid. He used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like anything. He would fast non-stop for consecutive days. And he would pray the whole night long. Okay? Imagine, he is like, you know, Rasulullah never told me that I'm going to be entering Jannah. But this guy, he's going to enter Jannah. Why? I want to know. When I'm worshipping all night long, and I'm doing all of the fasts, and I'm doing all of this, and I'm amongst the great... And he, I mean, of course, I'm just, you know, just putting a little bit of icing on the cake here, but inshallah, halal way, and then the sunnah way, that, you know, he's like, why? What is... He's so curious now. And Abdullah ibn Amr, uh, ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Amr, okay, his father is Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu. Who was he? The conqueror of Egypt. The ruler of Egypt. Okay? So he's a very noble lineage. Now, Abdullah ibn Amr, his... Do you know what the difference between Abdullah ibn Amr and his father is? Was? How many years difference was it? 11 years. So that means that when Abdullah ibn Amr was born, his father was 11 years old. Okay? And yet we delay our marriages to 30 years, 35 years. SubhanAllah. What do you want to do? PhDs, scholarships, what not? You end up doing haram more than anything halal, my dear brothers and my sisters. When the Prophet ﷺ has told us the ethics of living the life, we should be obeying it, not going against it and thinking that we're going to be having such high, you know, uh, uh, degrees and whatnot, statuses in society. So Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As has 11 years of difference between his father and he gets married. Before he gets married, his father used to beg him because he was such a pious worshipper that please marry for the sake of Allah. You know how we ask, how the youth are asking their parents, we beg you to make us get married, okay? And Abdullah ibn Umar ibn As, he finally got married, okay? And then on the night, on his night when he, you know, his wife, she's all subhanAllah pampered up, she's, you know, the bride, okay? And he's the groom, he, he reaches there. And you know, think, live the moment right now. He goes there, and he requests his wife very humbly, can I offer two rakah of nafil? Okay. And any sister, any woman would say, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, I'll let you pray. And he started praying after Isha all the way till Fajr. <laughs> Subhanallah. And then this happened after Fajr prayer. Now her wife is still waiting for him. Okay. First night. And after Fajr prayer, she, he goes to her. And she is like, subhanAllah, uh, she's getting ready, okay? So she's tired, she must have slept a few times, okay, waiting for her husband for these two rakat. She, I've married, you know, subhanAllah, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after Fajr prayer, she finds out and he tells her that I'm fasting. Okay, so, subhanAllah, this is like bang, 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 okay? And three days later, her, her, her father comes, okay? His father actually comes, Abdullah ibn Amr. Amr ibn Abn As comes and asks, you know, to check out. You know, everything's nice and dandy, okay? So he asks the, uh, the, the bride, how's my son? And she goes, you know, you must know better. Three days he hasn't even touched me, okay? So he gets furious and he picks up Abdullah ibn Amr by his hand and takes him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Rasulullah, I don't know what to do with this guy. He doesn't want, he's married. He's fasting and he's, you know, he's praying non-stop. And then Rasulullah said that he got very upset. And he said, and this is an advice to the youth, that do not take 
your religion to an extreme as well. Rasulullah said, I'm married, I pray, and I fast, but my family has a haq on them as well. Going back, now that you know the background of Abdullah ibn Umar, that he is such a strong, he's such a very highly appreciated Sahaba of Rasulullah So he is like, Rasulullah never told me that I'm going to Jannah. What are the credentials of this man? So he starts going up and he walks up to the Sahaba. By the way, in Sahih Muslim, the, um, in, in this authentic narration, it's not mentioned who the name is. You know, like how, how many times we want to know, oh, brother Jawad, you know, he, the whole Melbourne should be knowing him, you know? And, you know, brother Yusuf, everyone should know Aidawa is the most successful organization on planet Earth. But his name is not mentioned because there's a lesson in that. There's hikmah in that. How many times Allah is telling us narrations in the Quran and not mentioning the names of those Sahaba? Because showing off Riya, this does not cost anything. If you want to be really clean from the heart, be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving on to the hadith back again, that narration that I'm telling you, he goes up, Abdullah ibn Amr goes to the father, uh, to the Sahaba who has been granted, who has been promised Jannah, where Allah Rasulullah has been telling. And he makes up a fable, he makes up a story that I fought with my father and my father has actually kicked me out. Can I please be a, a, a guest at your house? In those days, they didn't use to check driver's license, you know, I'm gonna ask the local police, you know, what kind of person you are, and so on and so on. So he said, okay, fine. This was the hearts of the Sahaba. And this is a Sahaba who has been granted Jannah, okay? So he, he stays there for three nights. Now he's very, very scrutinizing the Sahaba. He's really scrutinizing. He's making, keeping a, a hawk's eye. And he sees that this Sahaba, he prays five times. For Tahajjud, he's just waking up a few minutes before Fajr, you know. He's not doing it all night long. So he's getting disappointed. Next day, he's not even fasting. He's eating me. He's inviting me for breakfast. And three days pass by. And he's wondering what is going on here. After three days, he discloses to the Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Amr line. Look, I didn't have any fight. I didn't have any fight. I was making this up. But Rasulullah gave you this high status that you are a man who is going to be entering Jannah. What do you do that has made you eligible for being an inhabitant of Jannah? So he starts thinking and he says, look, you've seen me for three days. I've kept you as a guest and I, this is what I do. So he starts walking away, Abdullah ibn Allah, And you know, he says, Salaamu Alaikum. So then the Sahaba calls him back again. And he says that at night, Abdullah, I forgive people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do not hold grudges. And my dear brothers and sisters, if we want to reach to that highest level, because this dunya, I was telling you that example of the carcass, Allah does not, this world is rubbish. Allah does not like this dunya at all. And he's mentioned it several times in the Quran. With this, I will inshallah end my talk today. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who are following the principle of Atiyu Allah wa Atiyu Rasul. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us sincere worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cleanse our hearts from all the debris of all those enmities, of all those hatredness, of all those animosities that we hold amongst our, our brothers, our sisters, and our related people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our children to be amongst the pious and follow the footsteps of, of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu wa And we, lastly, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify, to correct our intentions and make us the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khayran wa akhirul da'wana. Alhamdulillahi wa